coming up on Rob on the Road. All Go with me on President Franklin Roosevelt's presidential yacht. Set sail. Look at this. Look at the sun going over the top of that fog. Isn't that amazing? Unbelievable. On the floating White House aboard the USS Potomac on San Francisco Bay. Plus, get up close to the mighty murals of Coit Tower, created under Roosevelt's Get America Moving program. You have a behind the scenes tour of some spectacular art. And I'll take you through these closed off doors to a private deck. Look at this view. For views of San Francisco you don't want to miss. And later, a hidden Sacramento gem, a rock garden rooted in Roosevelt's work programs still alive today. What a work of art. Thank you. <laughs> and now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. Welcome to a special half hour, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Northern California legacy. I'm Rob Stewart. President Roosevelt's legacy was and is tremendous right here in our region. His New Deal programs dramatically impacted our economy during the Depression. A big example is the Works Progress Administration, which funded construction and art projects all across the country and here in the Golden State. Many are California icons today. Like the Tower Bridge in Sacramento, funded by the WPA and built in 1935 to better connect Sacramento and West Sacramento. It was the very first vertical lift bridge in the California highway system. More New Deal projects were funded in California than any other state in the country. FDR was elected president four times and was a major pivotal figure in 20th century world events. And a stunning California treasure, now in San Francisco Bay, was a source of respite and recreation for Roosevelt during the Great Depression and World War II. Let's explore the USS Potomac, known as the Floating White House in the Port of Oakland. Well, all aboard, welcome aboard to the USS Potomac. We are here with Marty Burchell, who is the CEO of the USS Potomac Association. Hello. Hello yourself. Nice, nice to, to meet see you. you. What a location. What a job. Oh, it's tough, but somebody's got to do it, you know? <laughs> Beautiful boat, sail on San Francisco Bay, work with fabulous volunteers. It's tough. It is. It is. This is gorgeous, Marty. Thank you. The USS Potomac, the floating White House, this was FDR's presidential yacht. Correct. It is an amazing piece of history, and there's an amazing history to the ship. So we're going to get an overview of the USS Potomac. We're going to take a tour, and then later tonight, the showstopper, you're going to set this thing sail. Oh yeah, we're going out for two hours. We're gonna see the Golden Gate Bridge, sunset, and the bay lights. Welcome to the fan tale of the USS Potomac. This was FDR's favorite spot here. Yes, indeed it was. He would sit in one of the chairs or on the couch behind us. And you'll notice that the couch is very, very wide and that was so it would support his legs. I see. And he could go all the way back and his legs would be fully supported. He had a lot of congressional people on board. He had royalty on board. This was such a pleasant place and he would take the Potomac down the Potomac to Chesapeake Bay to get away from the heat and all the muggy weather in July and so forth. And even one of his famous fireside chats That's was done from right here on the USS Potomac. I am sitting in the little cabin of the little ship Potomac. Well, I can't wait to go on a tour of the USS Potomac, but before we do, this vessel itself has a storied history. I mean, you talk about from when it started being built uh -huh. in the mid-30s until it was the presidential yacht from 36 all the way to 45. Mm -hmm. But after that, what a story. <laughs> Owned by Elvis at once. Yes. It even sunk. When it left presidential service, um, it was sold to the Maryland Fisheries. And it served as a fisheries boat for about 10 years. And then they sold it 
to a couple of guys who took it down to the Barbados to use as a ferry. And then when the Seattle World's Fair was going to be in Seattle, uh, they decided it'd be a great idea to bring it up through the Panama Canal to, you know, as a, an attraction. What happened was they broke down in Long Beach. They didn't have enough money to repair the ship, so it was going to be sold for scrap. Well, um, Elvis Presley heard about it, so he bought it, and he was going to give it to the March of Dimes, but they, didn't, they declined, and so he gave it to Danny Thomas for St. Jude's Hospital. They sold it for 55000 and um, a woman in Long Beach took it on as a museum. She sold it to another man from up here in San Francisco who ostensibly was going to use it as a figurehead for charity. Hmm. In fact, he was running drugs out of Mexico. What a decline. And he got busted, she got busted, the Potomac got busted by the DEA, and she was impounded at Treasure Island. And sunk. And sunk. <laughs> she had pin, pinprick holes all throughout the oh. hull. And then in 1983, it was refurbished. It began to be refurbished. There was a lot of love poured into this ship over the period of its restoration, which took about 12 years. Mm. So we opened to the public in 1995, and we've been open ever since. We cruise on the water, we take dockside tours, and most importantly, we focus our programs on education. The thing that's so exciting about it is it, it's an experiential learning. They remember being on the president's ship. Well, and you know, there are so few places that you can literally put your hands on history. That's correct. This is one of them. Oh yeah, you can sit in historic places, you can listen to the president's voice, you can see the historic binnacle, which is up in the pilot house, and I'm sure we'll show you that. I know one of the docents is going to give us a tour, and you're going to take us out on the bay coming up. You betcha. We're inside the presidential dining room with docent Charles Norman. Good to see you, Charles. It's nice to meet you. And we hear you know everything about this ship. Well, just about. Okay, <laughs> good. This is the USS Potomac 1936 Bell. All right. This is the president's table. This is where President Roosevelt would have his meals. Right. Yeah, he would have his meals here, entertain his guests, and uh, also maybe uh, use the desk that we have over there and maybe work on his stamp collection. He was an avid stamp collector, over a million stamps. Right, yes, he did. We're inside the presidential stateroom, the bedroom, and right here is where the president slept. Yes, you would sleep here. Uh, it was just one bed, of course, and of course you might wonder where his wife slept when she was on board. Uh, but as far as we know, she did not sleep on board. She did come aboard many times during the day, but just not overnight. How often would the president actually stay here? Uh, this was, it was sort of a weekend retreat, so it was mostly weekends, extended weekends, that he would come on board. I have to ask about his dog. <laughs> yes, he had a dog, a Scotty, uh, named Fala. Mm -hmm. and he, Who went he on, loved. Yes, he did. And he went on most of the trips on, on the ship, so the Fala was on board the ship. We're inside the radio room now, a small room, but packed with big history, Charles. This is where all communication onto and off the ship took place. There were two means of communication. There was a shortwave radio such as this, and the telegraph. Oh, wow. Yes. That's the real thing. You really get the feel of the massiveness of the ship, although it's only 165 feet long. Right. It still feels very large out here on the bow, which was for the crew. Right, mainly for the crew. This is where they did their work. How many people did it take to crew this ship? Uh, Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. Yes, there were three officers and 54 men who uh, ran the ship. Les Dropkin has been a docent here for almost 20 years. Hey, Les. Hi, good to meet you. Nice to see you, and welcome to the boat deck, the top deck. This is the elevator used for President Roosevelt. Yes. It was literally just a platform, ropes, and a pulley. Wow. And he would haul himself up. He would haul himself up? Yes, you know, he was very, very strong in his upper body, and he could manage it. This looks like it would be a smokestack. It, it was originally a smokestack. They took the rear smokestack to be the housing for the elevator. That's pretty neat. Yes. Mm. 
Marty, look at this. Look at the sun going over the top of that fog. Isn't that amazing? Unbelievable. We have set sail out on the San Francisco Bay on the USS Potomac. It's a learning experience for people, but it also allows us to tell the story of how critical this man was to the United States when he was president. And all around San Francisco are marks of the work that FDR did with his brilliant ideas of putting people back to work. He could leave Washington on his own if he wanted to, with maybe an aide or two, and spend the quiet time going down the Potomac toward the Chesapeake, thinking about the things that he needed to do. Do you think about President Roosevelt when you're on the Potomac? He's here. No kidding. What do you think President Roosevelt would think about all these people here on the USS Potomac? I think he'd be celebrating. He'd probably be sitting in, his, sitting in the back with a stogie in his holder and a dirty martini or a good glass of wine and saying, hello everyone, <laughs> welcome aboard the Potomac. <laughs> the legacy lives on. Oh, absolutely. And we're so glad that you all were able to come and enjoy it with us. Oh, me too. The Works Progress Administration got people back to work and the country moving during the Great Depression. And FDR made sure that art played a major role in the movement. San Francisco artist Ralph Stackpole was among the artists who created masterpieces during the Depression, including this stunning mural at Sacramento City College. Stackpole spent the summer of 1937 painting a mural on plaster in the lobby of the auditorium and was paid to do so by the WPA. Look closely, the mural shows people in various forms of work like airplane design and agriculture in our area, and it showcases a bright look to the future. The mural is in excellent condition today. Stackpole also secured the commission for the massive murals inside an international icon in San Francisco, Coit Tower the birthplace of the art movement for the WPA, and the home of some of the most famous murals in the country. Well, look where we are, somewhere I've been dying to come to, Coit Tower for an amazing behind the scenes tour with the master tour guide here, Davy Crockett. Good to see you, Davy. Good to see you. I'm glad you guys were able to come today. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. You've got a lot to show us here at Coit Tower, which went through major renovations, opened in May of 2014. Right. The city spent $1.7 million to restore the tower to some sense of what it was originally. They've done everything from structural stuff, getting rid of asbestos, lead-based paint, to really focusing on the art. Tell me about the history of Coit Tower. Lily and her family moved here in 1851. Lily Coit. Exactly. Lily grew up not too far from here. Back then, there was no civic fire department. Yeah, they were volunteers. So there were these hand-pulled things, and they would race them. And Lily adopted this one company called Knickerbocker Number no. 5. She ended up leaving $120,000, which is a third of her fortune, to the city to build something beautiful. It took the city fathers five years to figure out what they wanted to do. This is the design that won. It's made out of the least expensive material they had at the time, reinforced concrete. Well. Now it is shining in its glory like it was meant to in the very beginning. So can we go inside for a tour? Come on in. Okay, thank you. My goodness. About 2,000 people a day come in here during the summertime. And what we're trying to do is do a paradigm shift in terms of having people care about the art rather than just taking the elevator ride to the top. The murals are spectacular, and it is fascinating to me that the murals were really the test kitchen, Coit Tower, the test kitchen for President Roosevelt's WPA project. Correct, it was originally set up as the Public Works of Art Project, PWAP, which was funded 
for about three months, and then the funding spun into the WPA. Once they saw that you could actually have bunches of artists all working in harmony. At a time when we were at our most distraught, you are in the heart of the depression. So trying to put a smile on people's faces was a big gamble for the administration and it seems to have paid off. The direction that the federal government gave the artists was pretty much talk about modern day California. And you see that, you really do see California's story being told in that day. And with a dramatic twist, certainly, the look on the strikers' faces. It blows my mind, the vibrancy of the colors here. Well, it's the nature of fresco. It's earth pigments that have been ground very fine, mixed with distilled water. At 80 years old, this fresco still isn't cured. So technically, this is still a drying painting. We're not gonna be around to see it, but people are gonna keep these things bright for a long time. Ralph Stackpole had the commission to he, do this art. This particular wall, just this wall, representing the industry in California. Ralph Stackpole is the same artist who did a very famous mural in Sacramento, at Sacramento City College. Yes, he did. He's a very fine painter. Detailed. Details, absolutely. I am so excited about what's next because behind a closed door and up the stairs, you have a behind the scenes tour for us. Yes, we do. Of some spectacular art. Let's go take a look. Let's go take it. Okay. Davey, why are the murals in the hallways blocked off from the public? Well, there's no protection up here, so we bring people up here with no more than eight at a time under docent supervision. And you know, I'm sure that you can hear the echoey sound. It's because we literally are in the walkways all the way up to the top of my town for I have to point out right here when you walk through the front door, this is Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes, it is. And they're looking at a drawing for PWAP. Right, it's a reverse map for the Public Works Art Project. Here you see a lot of sports and athletics. Outdoor life in California. Outdoor life in California. That's exactly what this is. Who is the artist here? This particular artist was Edward Terada. He was a native Japanese, very famous art professor in Japan. Over here, this is called the playground. Ralph Chessy was the only African-American painter in here from New Orleans. That makes me think of something. This painting being by the only African-American painter then in here. This painting right here, this mural by the only Asian painter at that time in the mural project here. And that leads me to the point that these murals were also about social justice. Absolutely. This is just the beginning of strong feelings. 1934, as a country, although we were certainly imbued with all the right ideals, there's still a lot of racist sentiments. I mean, today there's still a lot of racist sentiments, but they were really making an effort to make all this go on. And all the interaction among the artists, the fact that they were men painting, women painting, Asians, African Americans, all on the same par. Isn't that fantastic? And I love that it was ahead of its time. Very much so. This room is different than all the rest. Absolutely, different material, different technique, different color palette. This is Jane Berlandina, who painted on dry plaster using egg yolk tempera. Well, we've made it to the top of Coit Tower. Look at this view. You see Treasure Island, you see the piers, and you see the San Francisco Bay Bridge. This is the outdoor deck, which is closed to the public. The Belvedere level, correct. The Belvedere level, and tourists go about 20 more steps higher, and they're behind windows. But right now, we have the perfect opportunity to do a 360 tour of the city. So can we do it really quick? Absolutely. Okay. Come on ahead. Let's go. So look at this part of town. Transamerica Pyramid, Telegraph Hill, 
Let's keep walking. Look at this. Washington Square in the heart of Little Italy. At St. Peter and Paul's Church with the spires. Golly. Look at the Golden Gate Bridge. And up there you'll see the curvy part of Lombard Street with all the cars creeping slowly oh, down. Oh yeah. My gosh. And there's Alcatraz. In all its splendor. And then we make our way back over here to where we started. Such a splendid view. I'm it glad you guys were able to come and take a look at it. Literally leaves me speechless. <laughs> it is a special place. I had no idea the things I would see here and the sights I would see here as well. So thank you. You're very welcome. Here at Coit Tower on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Thanks, Davey. Welcome to the beautiful WPA Rock Garden here in William Land Park in Sacramento. The sign says it all, but wait until you see what's behind here. And this is Daisy Ma, who's been here for close to three decades. Good to see you. Great seeing you. Welcome to the garden. It is so nice to be here, and I hate to tell you this, but I have passed by here many times to go to the zoo, and I've never come in. Oh, a lot of people are surprised this garden is here, but it's been here since uh, 1940. In the mid-30s, the Rock Garden began formation with President Roosevelt right. and the WPA program. In 1940, it was completed, and it's still here. Yeah, well, there are times when it didn't look so hot. You know, like when I showed up in uh, 19, 80, uh, it had suffered a bit. It wasn't a destination, it was just a, uh, a means of getting to another location. It is absolutely stunning. So will you take us on a tour? Sure. All right, let's go. All right. After you. All right. Daisy, this garden is stunning. You spent 30 years working for the city here. Now you're volunteering here. Right. So they got lucky to have you come back, I'd say. Oh, yes. <laughs> after you retired. Right. Just look at this place. Everywhere you look, you see beautiful trees, mm -hmm. plants, and of course, rocks. Yes, yes. There are a few rocks. A few. <laughs> yeah. It used to be much more obvious that this garden was you know, uh, made up of rocks. I've never seen so many hummingbirds in my life. Uh, with the right selection of uh, plants, uh, mainly uh, salvias and other plants that are related, uh, you will draw all sorts of hummingbirds into your garden. And you hear them, and they're darting around yes. through the sky. Oh, uh, it's surprising how close they will get I to know. you. They could actually dart uh, between us. The rock garden is an acre large. Yes. It amazes me how you can just yeah, wind just your way meanders. and meander. Yes. Right. It's like a very naturalistic design. It's kind of a welcoming place for wildlife and uh, admirers of wildlife. I see that we are surrounded by so many beautiful trees. Yeah, there wasn't much money for the garden, and so I just happily decided that I would change that. I would start collecting plants, grew them from seeds and cuttings. Wow, I love that you found that skill in your life. Yes. And look at the fruits of your labor. Yes, yes. I have no children and so yes, I... Yes, you do. <laughs> this rock garden. <laughs> Let's keep touring. All right. This brings us to one of your favorite trees. Oh, I love this tree. It's a uh, Cupressus cashmeriana. It's so elegant. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I love weeping plants, and this is uh, the epitome. Yes. And for some strange reason, it's happy here. I love finding the unexpected on this show. One of the unexpecteds that we found today was that you planted these trees here. What does that make you feel like to be surrounded by all of these things that you put here? Well, it. It makes me very, uh, actually amazed my, uh, that so much of what I've grown from seed is actually alive and, and doing well. 
perhaps when I'm gone, these trees will continue to thrive and, and, and be, um, provide pleasure and, and amazement for um, future generations. Your legacy will go here for a very long time. In you, I see what the WPA was trying to birth then. It was giving people a purpose. Oh yes, it was. And look at this with you. Yes, well I studied art in college. In a way, this is my ongoing art project. Well, I will tell you this, what a work of art. Thank you. <laughs> what a work of art. I hope we've shared with you some of the legacy in California of one of the most powerful political leaders in American history. And that legacy lives on for you to explore in Northern California. That's gonna do it for us this time. Follow us for behind the scenes tours on Facebook and Twitter. And we'll see you next time right here on Rob on the Road. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sitting in the little cabin of the little ship Potomac in the harbor of Fort Lauderdale, Florida after a day of sunshine out in the Gulf Stream. Our well-considered philosophy for the attainment of peace comes not from weakness, but everlastingly from the courage of America. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org.